So I think we'll get started with some audience participation. So can you raise your hands if you are interested in China in some way, and that's why you're here today? I think everyone. Um, is anyone here interested in the Me Too movement, especially in Asia? Cool. And who's um, a writer? Any kind of writer, journalist? Who's an artist? Wow. Usually we get more writers than artists, but we have quite a few artists this time. Um, is anyone a translator? Wow, again, a lot of representation. Um, how about researcher, or academics, or think tanks? Wow, we have like a smattering of everyone. So this is really exciting because it's what New Voices is all about. We want to bring people from different creative disciplines and just under the banner of promoting um, women's diverse work on China. People of all genders are interested in you know, supporting each other. And again, show of hands, who is sick of going to events where every speaker is a man? <laughs> so that's actually how we sort of got started. It sounds like a joke, but in Beijing, some of us, we were, we were writers and artists working in China, and we're, we looked around and we were like, we're surrounded by lots of young women, um, lots of women who are working on China. But we see all these event posters, um, e including events in DC or in New York and, or in China, and the roster sometimes would just be all male names. <laughs> and we're like, what's going on here? It doesn't reflect uh, what we see around us. So some of us started a crowdsourced directory of experts who all happened to be female doing interesting things in China. And that really took off, partly with the support of SubChina, who did a podcast interviewing me and another correspondent, Lucy Hornby, um, on the initiative. And this grew into another conversation we had. Um, so now we have people telling us that because of our directory, more women are being quoted in stories. And that's amazing to see because a lot of the way people understand China is through media. So people who watch the BBC and they see more female voices being heard, that's wonderful. But there is still an issue. We looked at bookshelves and we saw that a lot of the books written about China and Asia were also male names. And we kind of had a conversation among ourselves, like why is this the case? Um, and a lot of us had some interesting and also disturbing discussions with um, agents and publishers and fellow colleagues and like, why aren't women being published? There's things like, oh, maybe women just aren't famous enough. <laughs> or maybe women just like don't know as much as the male colleagues. And of course, that's, you know, BS. So, <laughs> so we decided to use a network that we were growing to make our own print anthology and make a book that showed that all of these women, writers, artists, translators, researchers are doing amazing work. So we hope to publish that next year. And the deadline is December 1st. And on top of that, we're doing so much more. We're creating media. And I'll have our co-chair, Alice Shin Liu. She actually came all the way from Beijing. <laughs> I live in Vancouver now. Um, so can you come up and talk about our different projects and our podcasts? Hey, guys. Thanks. Thanks. Yeah. So um, thanks, Joanna. She is the uh, founder of the Direct3 project that she talked about that sort of started all of this. And I know her because she brought me and 10 other amazing women to a lunch in Beijing and said, do you want to uh, start a women's anthology because I'm sick of what I'm seeing. And I'm a translator and writer and I've been in working in China for 10 years in the field and I'm sick of it too. So um, we also believe that if one of us gets a book deal, the others will get book deals. So there's no scarcity culture, it's actually a culture of abundance. And so all of us, um, all of the people on our board who are all very seasoned, you know, don't have the same privileges that the white male counterparts do. And I'm so angry that I started a podcast, which I spoke to Kaiser Kuo about, and now it's hosted on SubChina, the New Voices podcast, where I'm co-host with Joanna, um, even though she moved, and which I'm sad about because I love Joanna, and Sophie Liu, who's based in Beijing, but will be moving soon. So the podcast is now seven episodes in. I hope you're listening. And if you have feedback and suggestions or topics, or you want to be on it, if you're a female creative writer, artist, visual artist, nonfiction writer, poet, translator, please tell me, get in touch with me. Um, 
We also have the website, newvoices.com, where we publish stories called New Stories. So if you know anyone or want to write for us, email us from the website. Um, there are links. And I really hope that people think of themselves as experts, you, especially women in this room. Like You don't need to wait for anybody else's approval. So just go and do what you really want to do. And that's what I do on the show is I push all the amazing women that I've known in my 10 years in China. And I say, you're an expert in this field. There's just no other um, excuse, really, because I'm really sick of all the male experts. And we hope to launch our writing, others' writing, too. And this is our New York-based board member. I'll pass on. been amazing that what started as a Google Doc about female experts turned into a book project and now it's an international collective and people have reached out to us without any recruitment on our parts. People Now we have chapters in Shanghai, Hong Kong, Taiwan, Berlin. Berlin people are really enthusiastic about new voices. I'm not sure why, but they're always organizing meetups. And we're also going to be launching in London soon, but New York is really special to us because a lot of us are from North America, and this is our first North American chapter, and it's amazing to see so many people come out and support, so I want to thank you a lot. And we also want to support our New York-based uh, committee members here. So Cindy, yeah. <laughs> she's been busy signing everyone in. Um, this is Cindy Gao and Jai. Jian and Chenny Shu, um, and they started the New York chapter and got this all together with Leita Hong Fincher, who was also was part of our committee to organize this. Yeah. Would one of you like to explain how you got this together? Um, hi everyone, uh, my name's Cindy. Um, I grew up in China and then moved here when I was 11 and then um, lived in China for a little bit as an adult um, and came back because of asthma. And um, I got involved because I think I just raised my hand after um, hearing Joanna um, doing a Slack channel chat um, on SubChina um, and just raised my hand simply uh, because I really wanted to um, you know, live here but be involved in the greater China world um, in some capacity. Um, so this seems like a really, really great um, environment and meet, uh, to meet great people. Um, and please join us. Um, you know, we're very much just organizing everything through chat and, you know, any idea is really welcome. And uh, we're hoping to do this, um, I'm, I'm thinking like quarterly, maybe? We'll do a big event and then um, hopefully also start, you know, increasing communication with you all as well. Um, yeah, anybody want to add it? And Jenny will explain. Oh, yeah. I just want, don't want to take any more time away from the panel, but because I think everyone covered everything, the origins, the Google Docs, anthology. The Twitter and the, and the social media. <laughs> so um, you can find us all over social. I think this is what happens when people are really committed to an issue and are passionate about it. It's just we, there were five of us that went to dinner one night, and then this just happened. Obviously, thank you, Verso Books. Yeah, and uh, we're going to wrap up in an hour, and then we, we're going to stay here and mingle and talk until 10 mm -hmm. with potentially dancing to follow. So, so come find us. And if you do, this is an open, um, an open event, so you can feel free to share it. It's actually going to be live streamed on the Verso Facebook page, and then they will put up a YouTube link. Um, so if you, you want to tweet about it, our Twitter handle is at NV Voices. Does everyone know our pun, by the way, in our name? New Voices? OK. Do we need to explain it? Darius, you want to explain our pun? <laughs> I think Schieffer does with that laugh. Hi. Anyway. Uh, new means? women, and it also sounds like the English word new. Yes. yes. <laughs> um, we had a podcast guest, a poet called Eleanor Goodman, who's an uh, upcoming episode, and she actually made the pun as well as we were interviewing her, and she said, actually, new voices is new because we've never heard female voices, so the poetry in that is that new is actually new, so this has not been done before. Just wanted to add. So last but not least, we'd like to thank our a collaborator, SubChina, who's been supporting us every step of the way, from promoting our female experts directory to helping us produce our podcast. So we just want to explain a bit about what China, SubChina is. 
Sure. Um, hi, everyone. My name is Jia. I work for SubChina. Uh, as you can see, that's our banner. Uh, so we are a digital media company based uh, here in New York. Uh, so our office is actually 10 minutes away from this location. Um, and uh, so we cover uh, uh, news uh, about China for Western audiences. We have our daily newsletter um, produced by Jeremy Goldcorn, who actually has uh, lived in China for 20 years. Uh, but he was originally from South Africa. And uh, so uh, introduce myself. So I'm actually a video editor for SubChina, and my colleague Jia Yuan, uh, she works, uh, she writes uh, social uh, uh, culture stories for our um, uh, website and for our newsletter. Uh, and I also produce video content. Um, so um, everybody, please uh, download our app, um, check out our podcast, Cineca Podcast, uh, check out our videos, and uh, uh, you know, learn more about China. I just, just want to say, um, China is very honored to be part of this event. We are all here for female power. Our company actually is founded by a woman, Anna Chen, who's here with us as well. Uh, <laughs> yes, so glad to see so many people here, and I hope you enjoy the night. Yeah, thank you. Would you mind adding if people want to donate to our oh. uh, boxes next to the wall? Oh yeah, we do have a donation box right there b besides the beer uh, refreshment station, so that would be to cover transportation for our guests. Thank you. All right, so... Is the mic on? Ooh, so much booze in front of me. All right. Hello? Oh, great, great. Well, thank you, Verso, for setting this up. This is way more high-tech than any event we've ever had. <laughs> so thank you, and like great lighting and everything. So without further ado, I want to introduce our esteemed panel of experts who all happen to be female. And if everyone here is interested in China and women's rights in China, so there's, I think there's no other place better today all over the world than this room for you to understand anything you want to know about women's rights and the women's rights movement situation in China. So next to me, we have Leita Hong Fincher. She's been a journalist and now an academic for a long time on China. And you may know her from her first book, Leftover Woman, which really launched this conversation about women's status in China. Why are women seen as leftover if they're over a certain age? What's it, 27 years old? Yeah. <laughs> Younger than that now. <laughs> oh my god, the leftover is like 25 now in China? Like, what is it? It's crazy. So, Leita is, she is just a powerhouse, and she has another book out called Betraying Big Brother. It's all about the feminist movement in China, why the government sees these young women as a threat. And this is the topic we'll be exploring deeply today. And where, do you, uh, where are you based now, Leita? Well, we uh, moved here at the beginning of the last year, moved to New York. So that's my new home. Yes. All right. And then we have Rebecca Carl, which is very exciting for me to meet because when I was an undergrad student studying women's issues in China, she has all the books and all the articles about this topic. And so it's amazing to have her speak. And you're based in New York as well. Yes. Right. Can you tell us a little bit about your work and your research? I teach at NYU in New York, neither in Shanghai nor in Abu Dhabi, but NYU New York. We, we now have to say that, NYU New York. Um, I, I teach Chinese history. I teach gender and uh, women's issues. I teach on uh, Mao Zedong and the Chinese Revolution. I have written widely on uh, 20th century Chinese history. And I actually am writing a book that will be published by Verso uh, next year. Thank you, Verso. <laughs> and last but not least, we have Lupin. And Lupin is also like a personal hero of mine because I've seen your work since like a long time ago. You've been so prominent in the women's movement in China for a long time. So she was a founding chief editor of Feminist Voices, one of the biggest women's groups in China. And what's really interesting about that group that I find is that it really unleashes the power of social media to reach a lot of people to create social change on the grassroots in China through like 
you can talk about the different campaigns. And Lupin, um, she's now living in Albany in New York State, but she's still very involved in the feminist voices in China, and she'll let us know more about that. Um, and she's really modest, so <laughs> she understands English perfectly and speaks perfectly, but we do have Cheng Lu um, as our translator so that Lupin can speak in the language she's most comfortable with. So thank you, uh, Lux Cheng Lu. She's a bilingual uh, English and Chinese writer, as well as a Sinophile and a translator. So thank you for your help today. All right. All right, so let's just get right into it. Can, can we start with um, Rebecca? Can you tell us a little bit about the birth of the Chinese feminist movement? Like, where do you trace it back to, to the point that it is today? Trace uh, from its historical roots all the way linearly through till today. We could say that the feminist, uh, a feminist understanding of the world began uh, in a systematic fashion at the turn of the 20th century in the last dynasty, during the Qing dynasty. And this feminist understanding of the world meant not so much women's rights as such, but how to understand the world in a feminist perspective, putting women and gendered relations at the center of, the, of, your, of your interpretive uh, strategy. And I did a translation project with two uh, colleagues of mine, um, and this is not a Verso book, so I'm keeping it covered. But, um, <laughs> but this is a, a book that we did uh, that was, came out with uh, Columbia University Press, and it's called The Birth of Chinese Feminism, uh, Essential Texts in Transnational Theory, and it excavates what we consider to be the first feminist, uh, the first Chinese feminist, a woman named He Ying-jen, who was an anarchist, actually, and uh, was her feminism was as informed by her anarchism as her anarchism was informed by her feminism. And so we translated a lot of her work and uh, introduced her and so on. And it seems to me that the impulse to um, to to interpret the world in a gendered feminist fashion is one that has come and gone over the 20th and 21st century in China. It's always a latent possibility. It hasn't always been at the forefront of the historical moment, but it, it comes back. And at times of real crisis, at times when, uh, when, when the historical norm no longer holds, or when things seem completely out of whack, as they do today, it seems to me, that's when feminism really has a chance to come back and the latent uh, aspects of a feminist vision of the world uh, come back into focus. Always differently each time because it's, uh, it's responding to a different kind of configuration in the world, but always with a certain kind of, um, of, of sense that gender and equality and justice requires a complete restructuring of the world, not merely a reform of certain aspects of social life. And it seems to me that that's where Leita's work really points, and that's where uh, we can find ourselves today. Leita, can you pick up where Rebecca stopped? Um, and your, your work really focuses on contemporary Chinese feminists. And I think, who, who among you know about the Feminist Five, a group of five feminists who got arrested before Women's Day for handing out stickers about sexual harassment? So it was, Hillary Clinton spoke out, it became an international movement. And people started, more people started being interested in the feminist movement, but Leita, you've been tracking it way before then. Can you tell us a little bit both about the scope of your book and why you decided to write it and this group of people? Sure. Uh, well, I actually knew one of the women who became known as um, one of the feminist five. Um, Li Maizu. Uh, I wrote about her a little bit at the end of my first book. And so um, in 2015, for those of you who don't know, um, 
there were uh, uh, there was a group of feminist activists in quite a few different Chinese cities who were planning to commemorate International Women's Day by handing out anti-sexual harassment stickers on subways and buses. Um, but before they were even able to hand out the stickers, the Chinese police carried out a very sweeping round of arrests in a lot of different cities, um, arrested at least 10 feminist activists. But then they ended up focusing on five young women who became known as the Feminist Five. They brought the women who were not in Beijing all to Beijing, put them in a detention center, and it looked as though these women were going to be criminally prosecuted um, for some kind of disturbance of social order. And so um, the Chinese government in jailing these five young women at the time, I believe, were trying to wipe out the possibility of a large scale feminist movement developing. But that move radically backfired because um, it just galvanized the feminist community inside China it galvanized a lot of people who had not really believed in feminism or seen the need for it before um, inside China. Um, outside China, there was an, an enormous diplomatic outcry. You mentioned Hillary Clinton, who was considered to be the front runner for the US presidency at the time. There were other heads of state. Um, then there was a lot of social media pressure as well. So um, the hashtag free the five in English outside China went viral. There was a lot of international news coverage. Um, and the timing of the jailing of this women, these women, the timing was just so uh, ironic because Chinese President Xi Jinping was preparing to co-host a United Nations World Conference on Women in New York just, just uh, a couple of months later. And so the blatant hypocrisy of the Chinese government was drawn into sharp relief, where on the one hand, the Chinese president was going to be promoting, supposedly promoting global women's rights in New York, and on the other hand, they're jailing young women for um, commemorating International Women's Day. So after 37 days, these women were released. Um, and they were in, under de facto house arrest for a few months. But as soon as the authorities kind of loosened their grip on these women, um, I was in Hong Kong at the time. I just went to all of the different cities where these women were, and I interviewed um, all of the feminist five. Um, I mean, I already knew one of them, Li Maizu. Um, but then after doing these interviews with them, I realized that actually this feminist network is much bigger and broader and deeper than I had ever realized. And so I just conducted more interviews and, and it just, I just felt like I have to write this book. Wow. And we will get into the period you cover in your book pretty much how things have gotten really bad under Xi Jinping. And I've been a foreign journalist in China for the past seven years, so basically I covered everything becoming tighter and tighter, um, especially after she became president <laughs> until now. And now he, um, if you don't follow Chinese politics, now he's president for life or he can continue his presidential term indefinitely. So what we're talking about today can be the case going forward indefinitely. Um, so Lupin, I think um, it's so great that you're here and things are coming down all the way from Albany. And you are the founder of Feminist Voices, New Trans Jisheng, and which recently has gotten some heat from the Chinese government. So can you explain um, what it is that New China Zhisheng does and what the, is the current situation? Um, uh,在,在一九九六年的时候,我当时一些,我当时的一些同事,在我还是做记者的时候,我当时一些同事成立了一个组织。呃,我加入这个组织,并且从那时候开始一直都在,我一直工作。我指的是,这个组织的发展也是
呃，开始的时候我们用了很多的精力来呃批判大众媒体的性别歧视，后来我发现这可能呃呃是一个不太有效率的路径，因为没有人会因为我们这些如此边缘的立场的批评而改变。嗯、呃、嗯。In the beginning, we spent lots of we made lots of efforts to criticize the gender discrimination in mainstream media, but Later on, we realized that this is not a very effective strategy because people will not change their means because of our criticism. So this is why I started the Organic Women's Organization and established Women's Voice. This is another kind of media. Um. So that is why I left my original organization and founded the Feminist Voice because Feminist Voice is an alternative media. 我指的是要在充满这个呃呃充满那个漠视和这个歧视的这个主流的空间之外，创造我们这个另类的空间。这个当然，这个另类的空间不是属于我们这几个人，它属于我们的社群。而当我刚刚刚当我们刚开始遇到这个社群的时候，我发现从来没有妇女组织真正接触过他们。So in the whole atmosphere. Of apathy and discrimination in the mainstream society, we founded this alternative media and alternative organization. And that organization does not only belong to us, the few people, the organizers, but belong to all the Chinese women. 我指的是呃呃，另类的媒体，不管它用的是什么样的手段，它最重要的功能跟大众媒体不一样的就是，实际上它是在组织人。他在建立我们，我们要建立我们自己的社群，而这个社群必须得是呃打上这个呃带有行动主义色彩的女权主义的标签的。What I mean is, whatever the alternative organization was doing, our main purpose was to organize the people, to mobilize the people, and to form our own community. And in order to form our own community, our strategy has to be an activist one. 呃，不管我们多少粉丝，有几百个，还是有呃，还是有呃十几万和二十万，我们尽量的认识我们的所有的读者，因为这是人和人之间的关系。而且我们要玩，呃，这是一点。另外，我们还，而且我们希望能够跟他们一起来讨论关于中国女权的呃最重大的问题。当然是，嗯、呃、，OK。So no matter the number of our fans, no matter we have hundreds of fans or millions of fans, we Always make the effort to know every of, every one of our readers personally, because we have to. We want to build the communication. We want to build the relationship with our readers, and with them, we want to discuss the state of Chinese feminism or the state of Chinese women's issues together. 当然，谁能够代表中国女权的声音，这可能这是一个这是一个呃呃，这是没有答案哈。我指的是呃。呃，我指的是我们是努力在这样做，呃，这不是一个呃，这不是我们自我期望过高，而是在于我觉得这取决于就是我们愿不愿意，我们愿不愿意为之承担这个责任和付出，在嗯。So the question, who could the question who could represent Chinese feminist voice or who could represent the feminist voices in China? This question has no answer, but we always. Make our best to do it. That is our effort. Does not because we have a higher, we have a too high expectation of ourselves, but because we want to do everything through our action. So, in today, sorry, last one. I want to ask you about social media because a lot of this writing was on your social media pages, Weibo, WeChat. Yeah. Uh, social media um, why did you choose social media? And recently, what happened? And can you explain why these? Channels were pretty much blocked. I mean, what is what we use? I used to use a phone call to make contact with my readers. Before this, 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 before so we tried all kinds of means to mobilize people, to organize people. In the beginning, without social media, or at the time before social media, I actually used text messages on the cell phone to communicate with our readers. And alternative media has to use all the available means that's in the mainstream society to do what, to achieve our goals. 
。社交媒体的第一个原因就是我们的读者都在用，所以我们也要用，我们要把内容放到我们的内容放到他们所在的地方。另外一个，嗯嗯。The fourth reason we utilize social media is all our readers are using it, so we wish to develop our content in the space of our readers. 另外就是我们呃，他的这个网状，他有利于我们建立他的社区。我指的是在，呃，所有我们的讨论之下，我们的读者他们在相互，所有我们的发布之下，我们的读者在相互讨论和相互认识，这是我们的组织化的方式。And another reason is the organizational situation or the the organization of the social media is very effective for us to form our community because our community. Members could discuss the situation of Chinese women among themselves. So in March this year, again, just after International Women's Day, Feminist Voices Weibo's account was shut down, and that had a quarter of a million followers. So can you tell us about the current situation? Why do you think you were censored? 二零二零一年的时候，呃呃呃，女权之声是第一个敢于在微博用这个女权标签的一个呃公共平台。当在二二零一八年这个女权之声它被禁止的时候，我看到有成千上万，我我我看到我们的梦想实现，就是成千上万的人，他开他们开始在社交媒体上认同这个女权主义。嗯，这可能就是女权之声要消失的原因。In the year 2011, Feminist Voice was the first media outlet to use the label feminist on itself. By the year, by this year, by the year 2018, I could see thousands and tens of thousands feminist, tens of thousands media outlets using the label feminist and identify with feminism. Maybe that is one reason why Feminist Voice has to disappear. I'm going to ask Rebecca to also give some more context. Um, can you speak a bit, Rebecca, about why so many women in Chinese history, contemporary and um, in different decades, have used writing and art as a medium to spread their messages? And to what extent were they successful? Well, if we understand that... Yeah, I'm trying to speak into it. Uh, if we understand that uh, underlying the rights problem, the problem of, of equal rights, the problem of Chen, of new Chen, of, of, uh, of women's rights, is a problem of ideology. Uh, there's, an, uh, in order to make that ideology visible, in order to make that ideology legible, in order to make that ideology attackable and, uh, and, and uh, confrontable, you have to use um, art, literature, cultural means, um, and you have to uh, make sure that people see that ideology not only in a routinized fashion in their everyday lives, because that just becomes part of an everyday uh, knowledge. That becomes part of a common sense. You have to defamiliarize that common sense. And it seems to me that one of the ways to do that, and one of the ways that feminists have done that over the years, from the early 20th century all the way into today, is through uh, the, the, the method of defamiliarization. Just like what we're doing today, when we were introduced today, you're used to seeing men talk about China. Well, we're defamiliarizing that. We're making women talk about China, okay? And we're being authoritative. We're being smart. We're hopefully, and we're be, we're being we're being we're being uh, we 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 know what we're talking about. And so you have to a uh, defamiliarize everyday commonsensical ideology and part of that process part of that project is to write literature to uh, feminist literature not just women's literature which is very important but feminist literature you have to produce feminist art uh, and you have to produce a different an alternative kind of ideological space and an ideological norm that is uh, able to take on a mainstream ideology in a way that is, um, that is, that is consumable, 
because these are, after all, market commodities and they have to be consumed, uh, and that are that is uh, persu persuasive. And so over the years, from, from, from the early 20th century forward, there's been a real um, uh, uh, concentration and a, real, a very consistent generational, uh, sometimes it's really very, very clearly generational. It's daughters and what mothers. I mean, it's, it's, it, it goes in a, in a very uh, sort of familial generational fashion. But also, there's just been a generational handing over of the baton to various uh, uh, feminists and, and, and uh, cultural producers who have taken on the mainstream ideology in ways to make a feminist ideology visible, legible, and persuasive. Sharing that as a mainstream media correspondent in China, I got so little pushback whenever I wanted to cover the feminist movement and gender and LGBT issues. So it seems like slowly things are changing. But for foreigners, for Chinese journalists, I, I hear that it's still really difficult for them to convince editors at Chinese publications to, to run stories, um, even though Me Too was covered in Chinese media domestically. I would just say that it's also really uh, what, what uh, Lisa is doing what Liu Ping is doing, what uh, uh, New Voices is doing, and so on, is really, uh, you know, people say, well, is it effective? Is it changing everything? Is policy changing? Well, that's a longer term process, okay? That doesn't, that doesn't happen overnight, and that doesn't happen uh, in any sort of linear fashion. And so what they're doing is making sure that there are feminist voices in the, in the, in the mix. And this one gets shut down, another one's gonna come up. That one gets shut down or gets moved, another, a whole bunch more. You're creating the conditions of possibility for a feminist, for feminist voices, because there isn't just one feminist voice, there are many voices, uh, so that for, for feminist voices to be heard and to be, um, to, to, to fill a space. And I think, you know, latest work really has um, helped that cause enormously. Newton, of course, has helped enormously, and others as well. Yeah, and if you do want to learn more about social media censorship in particular, I just want to plug uh, Pan America's research. We have James Tager here, um, who was my research supervisor when I was working on the ground on um, a report for Pan on how Chinese writers and artists, including feminists, use social media and what they do, what, what they do to cope when their accounts get shut down. And it, you're right, they do find new ways to get their messages across. Um, so just second, stepping back to set the stage more, like what are things like in China? What, is, what are things like in China under Xi Jinping in particular? So Leita, would you mind speaking about whether you have seen things getting better or worse in the last six years she has been in power? progress and what aspects are, is there actually a regression in women's rights? Well, there's no question. I write a, quite a bit about this. Um, I have a chapter called China's Patriarchal Authoritarianism, where I talk about how it, this is not just something that is suddenly um, happened under Xi Jinping. It's actually, I argue, that sexism and misogyny and the subjugation of women has really being the, uh, a central feature of the Communist Party's authoritarian rule over the entire country, going back many, many decades. Seeing women as reproductive tools of the state, um, and, and now, uh, particularly under Xi Jinping, that push um, to get women to, well, you know, I completely have not even addressed the early communist era which held up the rhetoric of gender equality and Mao Zedong famously said that women hold up half the sky, um, but let's just jump over that part. That was a big part of the founding of the People's Republic was um, uh, using gender equality to mobilize women to join the communist revolution and uh, deploying women into the workforce en masse so that China used to have probably the world's highest female labor force participation. Well, all of that has been really undone um, since the onset of market reforms. 
Um, but this, this resurgence of gender inequality, which I started writing about with my first book, but th that has just uh, exponentially increased under President Xi Jinping. So earlier this year, um, China abolished presidential term limits, so it's, it's, we're seeing a huge resurgence of authoritarian control even within the Chinese context, which was already very repressive. So there's, um, uh, there's a huge attack on civil society underway. Um, but I think it's, in, it's critical to emphasize the role of misogyny in controlling the population. So uh, a lot of people have written about Xi Jinping's personality cult, which we haven't seen since the Mao Zedong era. Um, but that personality cult is distinctly hyper-masculine. It presents him as a manly man, as the patriarch, the head of basically an accretion of all these male-dominated families. And within those male-dominated families, the woman is supposed to play the docile role, the dutiful wife and mother. She's supposed to take, to have babies for the nation. She's supposed to take care of the babies. She's supposed to rear them. She's supposed to take care of the elderly. Um, there's been a huge resurgence of this kind of propaganda in the last few years. A very aggressive push, particularly aimed at educated Han Chinese women, pushing them into marrying and having babies before they turn 30. There's a lot of scaremongering saying, if you don't have your babies before you turn 30, your baby will have a birth defect. Um, all of these kinds of propaganda that coincide with a major population policy change. Um, so under, uh, for more than 30 years, China had the so-called one-child policy. Um, for the last couple of years, it has officially implemented a two-child policy. But that, that new policy is failing. So in spite of this aggressive push to get women to have more babies, last year the birth rate fell. Um, and that coincides with the aging of the population and the shrinking of the workforce. So all of these challenges together coincide with the slowing of China's economy. Um, so the economic miracle, uh, the so-called economic miracle of the last few decades, that is over. And um, the Chinese government needs to find another way to gain political legitimacy, to survive as a communist party um, following the collapse of communism in the Soviet Union and across Eastern Europe. And so fundamentally, I argue that this um, uh, increased aggressive push um, of the subjugation of women, pushing women to return to the home, all of that kind of language and policies, um, it's fundamentally about the Communist Party trying to survive um, in, in, the, in the face of all of these new threats. Um, so that ties into my next question, because I think a lot of this is quite confusing for people, because a lot of the stuff Lupin and other feminist activists in China are asking for aren't radical. They're, they're not asking for Xi Jinping to stop his patriarchal dictatorship or anything like that. Um, and it's very, you know, even-handed. So, Lupin, can you talk about what are your main priorities as Chinese feminists? What are the main issues Chinese feminists want to see change in society? People always ask me this question. I agree that feminist activism in China is now politicized, and we don't have an anti-party agenda, and we are not trying to overthrow the Communist Party. 更多的关注，关注的是这个女性的这个经济、社会、文化的权利，而不是公民政治权利。We focus on the economic, social, and cultural rights of women rather than the political rights of women. 而且我们也更希，呃，更希，呃，更希望政府能够改进它的政策，而不希，而并无意触动，对，而并没有触动它的这个核心权利。We wish the government could improve its 
policies on these matters, and have, we have no intention to overthrow the government's, the core power structure of China. But you cannot decide whether you are deemed as a state enemy or not. Uh,在我们仍然很弱的时候,你穿着就已经表现出来,他可以让年轻的年轻的很多的年轻的女性,如何的追随,并且能够组织起来。When the feminist activism is just emerging, we already has we already have the power to organize and mobilize young people. And in the Chinese context, that is a potentially a very scary power because the organization of people put a threat to the state. 今天你, if today women could organize themselves to fight against sexual harassment, tomorrow they can organize themselves to fight against something else. I will not deny this possibility. 另外中国的这个意义的这个利益和这个另类的社会力量在不断的被扫荡。当所有所有的其他更更在更在反对前沿的力量被消声之后，这个女权主义它就暴露在这个前线。In today's China, the decent and alternative social forces or crack down one by one, when all the other more radical decent forces or the decent outlets will crack down, then they will push feminist activity to the forefront. Because I have to say that today the crackdown of feminist activity is the result of the government to get rid of the gray area in the society, in the in the civil society. But the gray area is actually a space for negotiation, for discussion. Sorry. 我指的是就在这样的一种被迫做而言选择的这样的一个状态下,女权运动被激进化。So when the gray area disappeared, people are faced with two options. One is love the country and love the party. The other is to become decent. And people are forced to choice, and that the result is radicalization. Hearing from our speakers is that it's not related to content of what Chinese women are asking for, things like ending domestic violence or ending sexual harassment or having equal opportunities in the workplace. These are things that are actually completely consistent with the founding principles of the Chinese Communist Party, but um, they're worried about civil society becoming more powerful and bigger in general. Um, people who can, like feminist voices, mobilizing and getting so much attention in social media. Um, it seems this is troubling the party because it, they're learning how to organize well. And maybe in the future they might organize for something that the government doesn't want to see happen. Um, Rebecca, can you talk a bit about your observations of how Me Too has played out and how recent... Um, manifestations of a feminist consciousness that's played out in China and what you think about this? Well, I mean, I think I've been um, both puzzled and, uh, and uh, uh, encouraged by the Me Too movement in China. I think that uh, at first, at least, to the extent that I know very much about this, which I can't say I know a huge amount, but uh, to the extent that Me Too coincided with anti-corruption campaigns against individual men, it seemed that it was not a threat. But to the extent, 
But to the extent then that Me Too became an analysis, a systemic analysis of gendered inequality in China, as in a, in a more general sense, it became quite threatening. Um, and so when it first began, I, it was it was uh, I uh, it was a um, it, it began on the uh, university campuses, so far as I understand it, uh, or at least that's where it became uh, most uh, vocal and most uh, clear. Was on university campuses against uh, individual professors and then against a certain kind of academic. Uh, uh, um, uh, Sense a, a sense of academic entitlement by male professors and male students, but uh, it seems to me that now even that kind of mild um, uh, dissent, uh, that mild kind of uh, critique, is itself now considered uh, too threatening uh, to the powers that be and uh, it's being shut down. I was in Hong Kong last, uh, in, in May, when a group of uh, uh, women from, uh, from Guangdong, from, from Canton, came in to give a, a, a series of lectures about Me Too in China. And um, there, there were a lot of um, undercover people, men there, the only men there were undercover men. They weren't so very well undercover, however. They were pretty, they were pretty noticeable. Um, and the, 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 the women were very, very bold in their, in their, in their uh, statements and in their uh, activism. But I understand when they got back to Guangdong, all of them had to you know, drink tea and do uh, the, the things that they have to do in order to um, deal with the police. So um, I think it's, it's, it's not obvious any longer uh, what's happening with Me Too. I think there's still a very large well of discontent, obviously, at the kinds of uh, sexual harassment to which women are routinely uh, subjected uh, in China. And I think there's a, a large amount of uh, awareness of it, but to what extent that can continue to be actually organized uh, in China is not clear to me. But I understand we have some. Yes, so we actually have a surprise guest speaker. This is amazing, like this is the best place right now to learn about China because we have so Sophia Huang Shui Chin here. And she was one of the most important galvanizing people in China's Me Too movement. She was one of the women from Canton, from Guangdong, who went to Hong Kong to speak about Me Too and got followed by police. Um, I actually got to meet her in Guangzhou, and it's amazing. She's like, all right, I'm in New York. I'm here on a speaking tour. I didn't know she was coming, so if you, <laughs> you told me, I would have put it on a panel, so. <laughs> but, but like, I put her on a panel anyways, so please speak about your role in Me Too movement. She was a journalist and she had her own experiences to do with Me Too, and she got the word out really early, like last, last fall. So can you speak a bit about your experiences? Okay. Thank you, everyone. I was so surprised to invite you here. <laughs> so uh, this is not expected. Uh, okay, I'm an independent journalist from China. Uh, so. I was sexual harassed before when I was uh, newly graduated working for China News Service in 2010, but I didn't speed it up. And then later, I touched a lot of my uh, f uh, female colleagues, and many of them told me that they were suffers from the sexual harassment before. And so in last year, in 2017, I was in Singapore, so, and then Me Too movement started. I think like, it's the best chance to push this movement in China. So I talked to a lot of female journalists in China, asked them, like, would you like to join this movement? Let's go forward to promote it in China. But most of them said, oh, I'm not only a journalist right now, I'm a mom, I'm, I'm a, a wife. So I had to concern about the reputation for my family and my wife, uh, no, <laughs> my, my husband, my uh, parents-in-law and my daughters, my sons. So um, then they don't want to spit it out, but they are willing to share their story with me. So I was thinking like, okay, what would be the best way for you to come forward? And then you don't need to expose yourself. So they said, oh, maybe a uh, survey. So at that time, I launched a national 
survey on female journalists about the sexual harassment. So uh, this survey lasts for a month in 2017 in October. So I got uh, more than 1,000 journalists, actually it's 1,764 journalists come to speak to me. And then I collect the data and share their story. So from the data, more than 80% of female journalists in China actually has been suffering from different kinds of different forms of sexual harassment before. Some of them actually was rape. And none of them want to spit it out because uh, it's a stigma to talk about sex, talk about sexual harassment in China. So I published this report and launched this uh, survey and then Luo Cixi from China and she is graduated from Beihang University, also the first case in China, in China about Me Too movement. She come forward, she said, Sophia, I want to do this with you because you are not only to encourage female journalists come forward to share their story, but you also want to introduce the anti-social harassment law or anti-social harassment mechanism into workplace and into the campus. So she was thinking this would be meaningful. So she joined. What happened to Yeah, oh, oh yeah, Luo Cixi was sexual harassed by a very famous professor in China named Chen Xiaowu. So uh, she was sexual harassed 12 years ago and there are more uh, students were sexual harassed by this professor, the same professor. So I was talking to her, and then I also talking to the other victims. So we kind of like have a group of uh, victims. So they come forward to share their story with me, and then we published her article, in-depth article about sexual harassment, like she was sexual harassed by a professor 12 years ago. So this article was published in 2018, the first year of 2018. It became the uh, new fresh, like the new star of Chinese uh, uh, Me Too movement in China. So it get huge attention. And just in one day, we get five million readers. Yeah, people reading this article and spread the news and talking about, oh, these uh, students graduated, doctoral graduated from Beihang University, one of the best universities in China, was sexual harassed by a famous uh, professor. So the professor gets that later. And then we, uh, after this article, there's more victims coming forward, and we wrote a petition letter to the authority, I mean the campus, and the Ministry of Education. Uh, the, I wrote a petition letter in three days, we get 3,000 signatures from the students. And then another feminist, Nei Zhang Lei Lei, create a group, like uh, encourage more victims or more students to write to your uh, university to ask for this anti-social harassment mechanism. So in one week, we got 8,000 students from 94 universities to sign this signature, to sign this petition. And the authority, uh, the Ministry of Education, finally agreeing that we are going to study this mechanism, we are going to introduce this law, but so far, uh, not yet. <laughs> and after this case, okay, okay, very quick. After this case, we had more than 50, we have more than 50 sexual harassment cases happening in China from the campus to the uh, workplace. So a lot of high profile people, people in power was named and many professors was lose their job and a lot of people, uh, but we also had some back crash. Okay, that's the main role I play in there. So I think that's it. <laughs> add that for people who don't understand uh, the political environment of China that much, what um, Sophia Huang, Huang Xueqin and these other women have accomplished is truly astounding because China is such a hostile environment. We've not seen any social movement really take off um, in this way since, I believe, since 1989. Every single one has been crushed or it's just kind of, kind of diffuse and just um, fizzled out. So really what, you know, what, what uh, Huang Xiaotin is talking about is you may think, oh, well, okay, we got, you know, they got 8,000 people to sign petitions, whatever. But it's truly extraordinary for a country like China. First of all, there's no internet freedom, and so they face this in incredibly intense censorship, which you could talk about. But just I just wanted that 
everybody to be clear about that context, how difficult it is. There's no, I mean, there, there, you do have media agencies, but there's, there's so much censorship of the news media. There's no freedom of, of assembly. There's no independent judiciary. So victims of sexual violence basically have no recourse. And so people coming forward, using their real names, coming forward about their personal, you know, shame, that considered to be shameful stories about sexual harassment in an environment where the retaliation can, can actually involve going to jail um, and certainly a lot of other forms of intimidation and harassment. That is just extraordinary bravery, so. Thing about the bravery and the and the extraordinary nature of this is that the redefining through their work, the redefining of routine male behavior towards women as sexual harassment, its naming as such has been a, a sea change. I mean, this was just routine. M male privilege was just an absolute everyday routine. And now it has a name. It's called sexual harassment. And people, and they, they did that. And that's, you know, quite remarkable. So. Great. And I know that Feminist Voices um, has been working about sexual harassment issues for such a long time. Like, why do you think, like, a lot of people don't agree that this was something that came from the West, that Me Too dropped into China and, like, changed China. But why do you think that the hashtag Me Too and the global Me Too movement um, helped inspire people in China, and it became so big. Gandor,这也是俄罗斯西中国密图的第一个实名当事人所公开表示过的。So the Chinese, Chinese Me Too movement, the Me Too movement in China was greatly inspired by the Me Too movement in the US. This is what Luo Xixi, the first Me Too activist, had openly claimed. The US Me Too, the American Me Too movement encouraged Chinese people to realize that sexual harassment is a problem that we could discuss. 非常重要的契机，而罗西西也采用了跟美国美国密特当事人所相同的手法，就是实名。实名是这个事情，是这个性骚扰不再是留言八卦丑闻，而是一个可以被报道的事实，公开报道和讨论的事实。罗西西， the organizer also used the same strategy with American movements, which is to use the real name of the victims. Real names make the sexual harassment cases not gossips or scandals, but a real case. Chinese young people started to discuss sexual harassment problems since the year 2012. I would say that sexual harassment is the main topic for the Chinese young people of this generation, just as domestic violence is the main topic to the earlier generation, because sexual harassment is a huge problem facing young people just either in school or just graduating from college and entering the society who are utterly vulnerable. 也，你也可，我们也可以说，他们选择性骚扰这个问题来表达对中国普遍的性别不平等的愤怒。We could also say that those young people choose the topic of sexual harassment to express their anger, their outrage to the gender inequality in China. 中国和美国相比，中国没有的是什么？中国没有任何呃真正嗯可以称之为制度性的性骚扰的措施。中国没有自由的互联网和相对透明的治理。我当然我不是赞美美国，只是相对而言。嗯。<笑><笑>
and foreign policy governance. So comparing to the American society, what Chinese, the Chinese society and the Chinese Me Too movement lacks is the change, the improvement on the policy level. And in China, we don't have a free internet, we don't have an open internet, and we don't have a transparent platform. We also don't have a judiciary channel to solve the problem. So what we could see are case after case of this sexual harassment and people's outrage over these cases. All these cases and all these outrages, all these outrage happen on the same platform. Oh, oh. All the outreach happen on the same space, on the same level, or? The is it working? <laughs> the fight against sexual harassment in China also formed, also produced the miracle to break down censorship. People always think that censorship in China controls everything, but the discussion of sexual harassment managed to break the censorship. Thank you so much for that. It was really enlightening. Um, Aleta, can you, you pointed out when we were speaking earlier that there's a lot of overlap between the women's rights movement in China and also the labor rights movement and a lot of organizing that we've been seeing on campus, which, like Rebecca said, is very unusual. You don't see people getting a lot of petitions signed in China. Like Things get shut down really quickly. And the fact that this is happening despite how strict Xi Jinping's administration has been is really remarkable. Can you talk about these different linkages with other movements and other causes? Yeah, well, I mean, um, I, I don't know if anybody has been paying close attention to the news out of China. There have been um, a lot of university, elite university protests in recent days and weeks. Um, and uh, these these protests are at, at uh, on the surface of just about labor rights. So these are elite university students at all at China's top universities um, are increasingly bold in standing up for the rights of ordinary workers. And, and the context for that is there's actually a lot of overlap. So I, I write about the feminist movement, uh, women's rights in general, but there's an awful lot of overlap with um, other movements. There's also LGBTQ rights movement, but in particular, labor rights movement. So even though we've been talking a lot about university campuses, and, um, and so the feminist activists themselves have all been to university, they're you know, well-educated. But this is not just an elite movement. This has crossed over into a movement of working class people. It's consolidating um, you know, the, the interests of workers with the interests of of uh, the more elite middle class students in particular. And so um, a lot of the labor rights activists who are now, uh, the most prominent of the labor rights activists who are currently in detention are also feminists. Um, let me give you an example. Perhaps the most prominent is um, a young woman named Yue Xin, who earlier this year was still a student at Peking University, which is widely considered to be China's number one university. And she was very involved with Me Too activism on campus. Um, and as a result of her Me Too activism, her Communist Party advisor broke into her, uh, her dorm room with her mother in tow and it, it, at 1 a.m. and forced her to delete all her files from her computer and her cell phone related to her Me Too activism. Um, and then, and she wrote about this in great detail and posted it online. Um, 
she was threatened by uh, university officials um, and said that she could face charges of subversion if she continued, that she was being used as a tool of hostile Western forces, which is a common form of intimidation. Um, so anyway, she, she was uh, made, uh, me too activist, but then after she graduated in the summer, she went down south and started uh, an effort to unionize workers in Shenzhen. And there, there's another um, prominent labor rights activist who was working, who, after getting a master's degree at Sun Yat-sen University, another elite university, got a job as a factory worker for months and was writing about the abuses of factory women, particularly pregnant factory workers. And so um, a, almost two months ago, there was a big police raid um, of the student and recent graduates, who activists who were trying to unionize these workers in Shenzhen, and they detained um, a, few, a few dozen of them. Those two women are the most prominent, um, Yue Xin and Shen Meng Yu. And they, there's a lot of crossover, so the, the feminism the feminist movement itself has been, for years, some of the activists, uh, particularly one of the feminist five in uh, Guangzhou, has been extremely deeply involved in the labor rights movement for many years. So that crossover, the cross-class movement, that also is a real threat. It's perceived to be a great threat by the Communist Party because, of course, if you look at, you know, China's revolutionary history, it's the coming together of, you know, the elite classes with the working class that <laughs> produces revolutions. Yeah, and that might be why, like, what Lupin was talking about on why social media is seen as such a threat and that to the point where they got deleted. Um, in China, everyone has a smartphone. Like people could be a garbage picker upper and have like a great smartphone, and a taxi driver's all a smartphone. So everyone's on social media, and people live on WeChat and Weibo. So that's another reason why it might be crossing class barriers. Um, I talked to a factory worker, a female factory worker, who uh, wrote a letter about the incessant, endless sexual harassment she gets on the factory line. And I hadn't heard about that before, but she she posted it online, and she got an NGO to help her. Um, so we want to wrap up in the next 10 minutes so we can focus on drinking and dancing. So we're going to open up for questions now. And um, as part of the response to the questions, if you feel like you have things that you have not talked about yet, when people ask you questions, you can also bring it up. So we have a mic here. Um, just stand up if you want to ask a question, please. And we will get Sophia Huang up here, too, if you want to ask about the Me Too movement in particular. Questions? Mm -hmm. yeah. uh, hi, my name is Emily Waltz, and I'm a researcher and a writer on China, and I'm uh, really happy to be here. Thank you, everyone, for a great panel. Um, Leda, in your book, you talk a little bit about uh, this dynamic that the activists seem to be facing, where the more they give in to the state's demands, the more the repression increases, where when they fight back, they see a kind of loosening or, or maybe just a intimidation on the part of the state and they step back. And I'm wondering if, if you and maybe some of the others could talk about that sort of personal calculation and how it happens where if you fight harder, there's more space, but at some point there's still leverage. It, you talk in your book about using family as leverage and other things to get people to sort of step away. Well, the thing is that, um, I mean, one thing that has really inspired me and, and, I, I, and I'm so astounded by is the incredible courage of so many of these young activists. And um, the persecution that they have to endure is just incredible. I write about that, in, I can't really talk about it too much, but I write about it a, a lot in the book. Um, just the level of harassment, you know, constantly being kicked out of your home, constantly being, you know, having authorities knocking on your door and, and you know, taking your fingerprints, uh, um, holding you for interrogation at the police station, um, you know, telling, get, getting you fired from your job. Um, so that, but the thing is that in, with 
quite a few, and I would say probably an increasing number of young people in China, we are seeing that that kind of harassment and intimidation is actually emboldening them. As Liu Pin said, it is radicalizing. The, the, the pressure, the intense pressure on all of civil society, but on young people, on young, young women, but also young men who are like-minded, believe in women's rights or LGBTQ rights or rights for workers, um, these young people are just uh, increasingly bold, and the measures taken by the government to control them are, in many cases, radicalizing them even further. And this is why this is one reason why I believe um, that this women's rights movement, very broadly considered, including all of its overlapping with labor rights, LGBTQ rights, that this movement is the most vibrant and extraordinary that I've seen since the 1989 pro-democracy uprising. And um, it's going to be very, very hard for the government to control it. We see that it, it already has been hard. I mean, the, the fact that, as Lupin used the words, miracle, it's a miracle that the Me Too movement has taken off in a country like China. It really is a miracle. And um, the authorities can't squash it by jailing all of these activists because there are so many of them now all across the country at all of the elite universities. And we just saw in the last 24 hours this incredible new protest at Nanjing University, another elite university. Um, and so who knows where it's going to go, but this confrontation between the Chinese government and young people who are, um, particularly young women, but not also men, who are increasingly standing up and saying no to the government, saying that, you know, I want equality, um, I, you know, I deserve to be treated with dignity. Um, and so they're, they're not fundamentally, as Lupin said, they, that was not their original goal, to overthrow the Communist Party. That's not it. But they're becoming more radicalized because they're being harassed so much. That was an amazing response. Does anyone want to add to that? Yeah, I just wanted to add that I think it's a big irony, of course, that originally feminists found in the Communist Party in the 1920s their, their alternative families. That's where they went in order to escape the oppression of their natal families and the oppression of arranged marriages and so on. And the Communist Party, in fact, um, while of course not without its problems at that time, was the place where women and men went to escape and, rad and live a radicalized life. Today, of course, the Communist Party is not that place any longer by a long shot, obviously. And so that women, as Leita says, are fine, and men, are finding new communities, new forms of community, whether it's online or in, in, in actual materiality, finding new ways of living radicalized lives in new, in new forms of community. Um, and I think that's really important to understand how people are going to find new communities to live their lives in that are not communities that are dictated by the state or through the state. Um, and the state can, can't, can't actually suppress all of it. And, um, and so it's, uh, it's, a, it's a cause for hope. Just to give a sense of the scale of this, the, the Women's Federation in China, which is the government body that's supposed to promote women's rights, is actually one of the most vocal bodies that are shaming women to get married and have babies very early. So you can see like the lack of hope that people see in the Chinese Communist Party. But there's never been a woman on the top leadership of the CCP. So we have another question here. Hello. Oh, oh OK. Hi. <laughs> um, hi. Um, I work for a show called Patriot Act. Um, oh, my gosh. Um, and I've been following this story for a while. Um, and so I have so many questions, but here's two. Um, could you help clarify a little bit you know, the legality of these sexual harassment cases. Like I know a lot of the people who have been accused just sort of apologize on social media, they get fired. But I'm wondering like right now in China's legal system, what are the mechanisms in place? And are they responding to these requests for a definition of sexual harassment? And my second question, okay, okay. 
Lupin, do you want to talk about that? Do you have any law about that? Me too. Uh, me too. 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 For the achievement of Me Too movement in China, we haven't achieved much progress in, on the level of public policy, but we did achieve a whole process of the, of the settlement of the problem of the sexual harassment problems on the college campus. Once a professor was found to sexual harass the students, he will usually be deprived of the of the certificate of, of the teaching certificate and in most cases he will be expelled from the school. But outside the college campuses, all the other people in other fields, when they were revealed as harassers, they didn't get punished. Just as what is happening in other countries, the victims or the, the whistleblowers are charged or are sued. So you said, 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 so so right now we are in the stage that the main problem is what on earth is the attitude to sexual harassment by our power structure. As for the definition of sexual harassment, I don't think that poses a big problem since there are so many professors were charged with sexual harassment, so it's an unspoken. There's an unspoken consensus about what sexual harassment is. There's a problem with Chinese law itself, where it does say somewhere that sexual harassment is bad, but there's no guidelines on how to bring a lawsuit against someone for sexually harassing you. Even the rape laws are really backwards. Um, there's no such thing as rape against a man in China. By the way, you can't. A man can't be raped in China. He can be assaulted, but no. Yeah, so can Sophia, can you talk a bit more about that? Just want to echo a little bit. I agree with Lu Ping, uh, but I also see a lot of difference has made since the Me Too movement uh, since this year, uh, because uh, it used to be like people not really coming forward to speak about like I was raped or I was sexual harassed before. People are so ashamed to talk about that. But after this 10 months movement, I think more and more young female or more and more young generations are more eager and more to, to talk about it. It's not like I feel so ashamed anymore. It's not this shame, I think, Heart of shame has already gone. So this thing, I think, is very important because even we do, we cannot make it into the criminal case because you need a, a lot of uh, solid evidence to prove that this is a rape, right? So and according to Chinese law, uh, we have some kind of law, but we don't have clear definition. Uh, definition about sexual harassment. So most of the time, when we argue the case, we don't use this sexual harassment as a as a uh, reason to argue, we use like Ren like the right of the personality and right of the reputation to argue the case. So, so far, uh, we haven't made a lot of change in the law or policy making level, but I had to, I had to say that um, I got some information from a lot of professors because I'm doing a lot of articles and in-depth reporting about the sexual harassment in different campuses in China, more than 10 cases actually. So I built some kind of relationship with professors who are invited to this group to make a draft about the sexual harassment, uh, anti-sexual harassment mechanism into the campus. So some of them actually feed me, uh, feed me the information which I'm supposed not to share in public, but I can share a little bit just off record. Like they said that they already have finished this draft about anti-sexual harassment 
in campus, and they already passed the draft, but they are waiting for the time to promote these anti-sexual harassment uh, uh, mechanisms in campus. And about the law, we have, uh, because I was also working with a lot of victims, uh, building a network to connect the victims with the lawyer if they want to make a criminal charge or want to civil case, I connecting with this, uh, psychology and the social workers. So I know a lot of lawyers are thinking now uh, China uh, just days ago we had the news like they are going to include uh, sexual harassment in uh, our uh, civil code. Uh, like the general law of civil code. Yeah, I think I make it correctly. So it's like there is a chance for us to really do something in policy maker to introduce anti-social harassment law. Yeah, that's what I want. Thank you so much. I'm glad you showed up. <laughs> we have one room for two really short questions, short responses. Um, <clears throat> I'm from Beijing and I just turned 30 this year. I stopped talking to my parents for like five years, Duan Lian, because they made a crew, relentless effort to push me to get married and have kids. And it's not uncommon for Chinese parents to say, you are worthless, you are selfish if you don't want to make effort to get married and have kids. They would send your, your profile to strange guys, like crazy things. So I just want to know, why? Like, okay, talk about pressure from the government to get us to get married, have kids. Yes, get it, got it. But why do the Chinese parents execute that? Do you mind if I answer that? Because I, I well, because my, yeah, I wrote all about that uh, uh, in my first book in particular. Um, and uh, I'm so sorry for your experience. And as you said, it, it's, it's so common, it's just so tragic that, um, yeah, that, that the parents, so many parents just will impose this incredible penalty on their daughters if the daughter doesn't find a boyfriend, you know, within the next year or get married in the next year. I, I mean, it, it's just awful. I, and I've heard, you know, some parents saying, well, I'm, I'm going to commit suicide if you don't bring home a fiancé in the next year. Um, and it's awful. But I do have to emphasize that a, uh, a lot of those messages are given to the older generation very deliberately by the Chinese government. And so uh, it, there was a real turning point that I wrote about in my first book, which was 2007, when um, this, the, this is not a short answer, but I'll, I'll cut it short. Um, but you can read my books. <laughs> uh, yeah, but a lot of that pressure is orchestrated, in fact, I would say primarily orchestrated by the government, which is targeting the older generation and telling them, you've got to keep up the pressure on your daughters or your nieces. Otherwise, China's going to go down the road of, say, Japan, God forbid, um, where so many women are refusing to marry or have babies, um, and then you see the aging of the population. And so there are all these warning, I mean, that scaremongering that you see in the propaganda every day, that propaganda is aimed at your parents' generation. And, and that, you know, gives them the message that they have to pressure their daughters. And so it's not, ju it's not just an individual problem. It's very much state orchestrated. I would just add that it, it mobilizes very effectively an assumption of a, cultural, of a cultural prejudice towards universal marriage that is um, supposedly embedded in Chinese culture for a millennium. I mean, there's always the 5,000 years or the 3,000 years or the 2,000 years or however, however many thousands you wish. But there's always the, it mobilizes a cultural presumption as well. So it's there's there's a real you know you can't be Chinese unless you have grandsons or grand grandbabies. <laughs> You're not properly Chinese. Yeah. And so even uh, you know uh, uh, gay gay men, lesbian women, they have to marry too. Uh, they have to marry heterosexually, reproduce, and then you know the parents leave them alone maybe. But uh, there's, there's a sense, there's a, there's a real cultural mobilization. 
Okay, so Verso has been really generous with their office. They were actually they actually work here, so we don't want to have people to have to stay too long. So we're gonna move to another venue, a bar down the street, and Cindy will let us know that area. And some of our panelists might be there. I'll be there. New voices will be there. So all your questions, let's talk about it in like a big group. Meanwhile, let's have one last question. I see you are really fast. <laughs> Um, hello, my name is Li Xing. Uh, I'm a senior student from Sierra Lawrence College, and I'm currently working on a uh, senior thesis research about how uh, social media accounts that produce uh, content about sex education are affecting young women's idea of sex, gender, and being a woman today. So my question is really related to social media. So I'd just like to ask that, uh, what, how would you describe the space of social media in China, and what is it um, particularly powerful about it that will um, help facilitating pushing the alternative and emergent uh, ideologies like feminism into the mainstream? And how is the space of social media um, is affecting the um, younger generation, the, especially the female generation, about their idea of uh, being a woman? Thank you. <笑>中国的两大社交媒体 the two major social media platforms in China are Weibo and WeChat. And Weibo is like a square, WeChat is like streets. No matter if you are on the square or in the streets, if if you have a public account, you can encounter your fans. So that the fem Chinese feminists are striving to build their battlefields on these squares and along these streets. And from we started from one public account about feminism. Right now, we have thousands of public accounts about feminism. <laughs> 呃，公号式的运作的。现在我更感兴趣，我现在我我还想补充另外一个非常感非常有意思的现象，就是微信的这个群。呃，我觉得微信的群比任何就英文世界的那个社交媒体，它更适合于人们的组织化。呃，在人
I also want to give a special shout out. This is Jenny Lau. She's studying at Parsons School of Design and she designed our new logo. So the new New Voice at Logo is all her. <laughs> all right. And thank you everyone for coming and traveling. And Alice came here from Beijing. She's still jet lag. <laughs> yeah, I had stuff to do. I had stuff to do in London. I didn't fly 10 hours, but I mostly miss Joanna um, a lot. So, Cindy, can you let us know the next steps? Because it seems like we had like 10 questions, so we can move just one block down and continue the conversation. Um, there's a bar literally a block and a half away called 68 J Street Bar. Um, so we'll just congregate there and hang out. Um, and I'm going to stand by the door and shame you into donating to us. Um, so if you're going to not go to the bar, so just think about donating your beer money into this box. If you are going to the bar, thinking about tipping your you know, door person on the way out. So we really, um, you know, all of us are volunteers and we spend our time to organize these events. So um, any money that you contribute is really to try to make these events better, you know, pay for our speakers' travels and, you know, nothing goes to our own pockets and uh, we just want to make it better. Yeah, it's just for North uh, Transportation. And Leda's book is also over there for sale and she is available to sign as well. So. So thank you, Verso, for hosting us. Thank you, SubChina, for collaborating with us. Thanks, for everyone, for coming.